Nicholas Vasilyevich Kazakov is 92 years old. He has been a communist since 1921. Lenin had come to the factory where he worked to hold a political meeting. On the 7th of November, times are less exciting for the communists. Empires are built by giants and destroyed by pygmies. Lenin did not just uphold Russia's integrity, he added republics as well. Today, Russia's head of state only knows how to destroy. Party militants were told to meet in front of Lenin's statue on the 7th of November, 1997. On this day that marks the anniversary of the revolution, Nicholas Kazakov joins the ranks of Zil, the automobile factory where he spent his entire life. Are there any young people in the party? Of course there are young members in the party, but I don't remember their names. They're about 50 years old or so. Any younger ones? Younger than that, there are none. Nothing to compare with the massive gatherings of the past. How many were present that day? 5,000, 10,000? No more. Even then, you'd have to add up all those marching under different banners. Those who demonstrated that day were the elders, who've benefited from the Soviet system a little more than the man on the street, but a lot less than the party leaders. For them, the traitor, the man who's destroyed the system, is Yeltsin, the man responsible for Russia's misfortune today. Forgive us, dear country. We failed to preserve you. Today, Amidst the howling of these filthy dogs, we must bear our cross and for a long time to come. At home, we just babble on. We have forgotten how to act. Towards the end of perestroika, three radical leaders came to hold office and have strangled our country. seven years ago to the very day. The same demonstration took place and great numbers of militants came to meet near the Kremlin. In the afternoon, Nicholas Vasilievich Kazakov had his family over for dinner. At that time, the Communist Party had not been dissolved. Gorbachev was still leader, and Nicholas Kazakov did not hold the same language. We are gathered here today to celebrate our people, the 73rd anniversary of the October Revolution. I wish to each of you good health and success in your field. Around the table was Lena, Kazakov's youngest daughter. Beside Lena, Vadim, a lifelong accomplice 
whenever the debate with Nikolai Vasilyevich took on a very political tone. Then Tatyana, Lena's elder sister, Kazakov's other daughter, and Vadim's wife. Of course, there were Vadim's and Tatyana's children, Elena, their daughter and son, Anton. At the time, there was something to put on the Kazakov's dining table. The table was still well garnished, but not for long. <laughs> Nicholas Kazakov, what has happened during those years? There have been some terrible changes in the country. In 1991, when Boris Yeltsin was elected president, our economy was already inclined to suffer a setback. But it wasn't irreversible. In fact, during the following years, we have witnessed the collapse of industry and agriculture. I know how senior citizens like myself live. If no one helps them, as it's often the case, they have to rummage through garbage cans, gather what others throw away, disinfect it, and eat it. I myself have been reduced to a diet of milk and dairy goods, which I have always believed to be poor nourishment. Today, I eat nothing but potatoes and milk. State leaders prone a cruel policy for the elder generation. The faster the old generation dies out, the faster they will be rid of our old traditions, our heritage, our identity. The best of what Russia has produced. The old generation, the Stalin generation. That generation of deported communists, other communists who denounced them, those who remained silent. They were Kazakov's workshop comrades. Fanstein, 17 years in the Gulag, died in 91, a die-hard communist nevertheless. Karzov, died in 96 and buried according to the communist ritual. Panyonina, 13 years of Gulag, Today she is very ill. And then, Filter. He went to live in Israel. Since then, Kazakov considers him a traitor. The crowd, the crowd has no common sense. Mad will is stupid. The crimes of all inquisitions have been carried out by the blind crowd. There is nothing easier for a tyrant or a demagogue 
than to madden the crowd. Hordes of people turn into a docile ram. When the crowd becomes bloodthirsty and tells the hangman, go ahead, the question who is right and who is wrong is drowned by screams of kill them. Thank you very much. But after what you've just said, Lena and I are going to look either like Stalinists or like terrorists. And you, you give yourself the best role, a Democrat. A lot of those who call themselves Democrats are actually nothing but fake Democrats. But I'm not talking about that. A moment ago, you just recited a poem denouncing the Stalinist system, which you have always defended. But Lena and myself be in agreement with this poem is normal, but you, that really surprises me. I don't see a contradiction. Neither do I. Eight years after that lively conversation, Vadim has changed a lot physically. He has gotten away from the crowds and now lives in a remote area in Tversa, 200 kilometers from Moscow. Tatyana, his wife and him decided that together four years ago. Vadim, the family rebel, an engineer at the Physics Institute of Moscow, retired. Tatyana, his wife, also an engineer, but at the Zil factory, retired also. Vadim first started out to open a car repair service. But in the process, he met what he kindly calls informal relations, meaning the mafia. During the time of so-called socialism, we could live outside the system. I, for example, worked in the scientific field. I came to know all the bad sides of it. But it did not affect my life. It affected me only slightly. Today, that has changed. It is practically impossible to live apart from the world, totally ignoring society. Whether we like it or not, everyone has to deal with informal relations. The only thing you can do about it is to radically change your way of life. That is what I did by coming here. Here nobody touches me, and I wouldn't let them. Six months out of the year, Tversa is covered in snow, and this train station in the middle of the forest is the only link with the rest of the world. About once a month, this train takes Tatyana to the city to keep in touch with the family. This is where she hopes to return to and set up an embroidery store. In the meantime, before making her modest dream come true, she is the one who is bringing up Oleg, her grandson. And in return, it is Oleg who helps her get through the rigors of change and Russian winters. Here we are literally plunged in the conquest of the North. I often think about this when I think about our difficulties. Those who are conquering the North have a difficult life. Here it's the same. 
There are a lot of good things about our new life, but we have also lost a lot compared to our former one. Anyway, all this is temporary. Some values disappear, and others reappear. That's life. I remember when you came in 1990. If someone was different from you, if his or her point of view was different from yours, the situation would get out of control. Even close friends argued. Today, I think most people have gotten over it. We got used to the fact that each one has his or her own point of view, and it's normal. It does not surprise anyone. All those little details of our former life fade away one by one. Those details just fade away. I mean, all that was done to make us all alike, to make us think alike, to make us act in the same way so that we could feel guilty whenever we stepped out of line. All that had serious consequences. Today, no one is surprised. It's become normal. Such a scene would be unheard of ten years ago. Politically incorrect. Both women would have been pointed to by the whole village. Now, all this makes everybody laugh. Well, today we have understood that relationships between people who care about each other, the love for one's parents, one's friends, are much more important than having a political viewpoint. That is probably why Vadim and I, my father and I, barely get involved in political discussions anymore. It does not interest me to talk politics with my father. What is much more important for me is his soul, his attitude towards me and others. Communicating with him as a family member is much more interesting for me. We are living in the shadows of pessimism, a ray of hope lit up, but faded immediately, and life goes on. The star of hope is inconspicuous. Business is blooming everywhere. Love, home, all that is romantic has become ridiculous. All that has been sold for American currency. An 18-year-old young man wrote that. Good for him. Thank you. Yuri also said that two years ago his friends and he could become students in any good university. Today, that is no longer possible.
In 1990, Anton Kazakov's grandson was 16 years old. He loves his grandfather, but he only listens to his political cliches out of politeness. The main reason for the gap between the younger generation and my generation is that we, the elders, when we say something, we do it. If we promise something, we keep our word. Personally, I have very often seen young people incapable of keeping their promise, and I am obliged to remind them of this bad habit. They say something, but they do not do it. They promise something, but they do not keep their promise. This is what Anton wrote to us at the time. Hello, my loveful Likons. Thank you for your letters. Time to confide has come. What fun happened last year? I got a lot of new friends, great dudes and dudettes, had cool parties, smoked marijuana in the zoo in front of monkey cells, rolling on the floor laughing my ass out. Became a famous underwater hunter, was a Moscow guide and interpreter for a French and Japanese students, caught a lot of fish and proved myself as a sex giant. I had a depression. Researched the Tykes climate, but the company appeared to be controlled by mafia. Nice cover and rotten inside. I've seen a lot of methods and principles I couldn't get along. After 30 days I quit. Don't worry, I wasn't suck, no open veins and heavy drugs and stuff, but wasn't fine too. I have made some serious steps which changed my life for this 1997th year. I am not going to finish my education this spring. Going to study one more year and pass final exams to get the diploma and degree next year. I didn't attend military classes and could be recruited any moment right after the graduating the university. I have made an official statement yesterday. They accepted. My stress immediately disappeared. I felt much better. The army is where lots of young people die, without even talking about Chechnya or Caucasia. You could compare the Soviet army to a prison. That is the comparison that comes to mind. I cannot imagine being in the army. It would be like committing suicide. If I understand correctly, you would become a deserter, is that it? Ah, you formulated your question very well. You see, that is the basis of my shrewd calculation. A deserter is a soldier who pledges allegiance and then runs away from the army. I won't become that kind of soldier, so they won't be able to enforce that law on me. Anton, do you still want to become a lawyer? At the Institute, we have been warned that to become a good lawyer, we must first study the legal system very well to know whom we must bribe. If you do not know that, forget it. You cannot become a lawyer. Without any doubt, such a practice exists everywhere else, but for me, with my ideals, it was hard to learn from the mouths of my professors that that is the way things are.
In 1990, at the Kazakov home, girls were talking in the same terms. Except that the system was different. It was not capitalism. It was still the communist period. You have to understand that in 1990, Nikola Kazakov's three daughters were leading the way. In our country, the only people who live really well are amoral opportunists, bastards who'd kill their own mother to get ahead, not people like us. The motto of our former life was, you think in one way, you say something else, and you act in yet a different way. We were living on the periphery of that system. And we did our best not to be part of that horrible, abominable force. There was a, a breed of bureaucrats and party officials. And thank heavens we have escaped that fate. 1998. To escape this fate, Lena has her own recipe. Culture. Culture as a means of refuge. As museum curator in the house of Maria Yermolova, the great Russian actress of the last century, Lena spends eight hours a day in another world. Culturally speaking, the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century had such splendid names and famous characters. Every time real life disappoints us in the present, we look back on that past with nostalgia. In 1998, do you feel it's a romantic period? I have never asked myself that question. I'm afraid not. Although each period puts forth its people and famous names, all that is beautiful, all that inspires our souls, Anything that takes us away from our everyday life, that's what I think, um, hmm, how should I say, well, that's what I call romantic. If during eight hours a day, Lena's life takes inspiration from fairy tales, after work, her world is more like Gorky's Backstreets. Here it is. We meet again seven years later in my community apartment. Here we are at the same door. Ila Matrivich, our grandpa, this is his room. It's still in a pitiful state. There's my neighbor's door. She hasn't lived there for two and a half years. She's been asking to have it repaired for the last two years now. Here's our grandfather, Matrovich.
ходить на кухне. Here's the kitchen, still in the same state, looking exactly like it did before. Grandpa lives in the kitchen now. He does his own cooking, and he even sleeps in here. And there's the doormat where he sleeps. He actually sleeps on the floor. Here is the bathroom. It's so dirty, you're afraid to touch anything in it. It's just too filthy, too dirty. Look at the toilet, right there. Lena's bedroom, which was a sanctuary in this community apartment, has changed a lot over the last seven years. What happened is that the Moscow municipality didn't carry through with the rehabilitation construction work. So the pipes started to leak. Seven years ago, when you came for the first time, they were already leaking. Here is a pipe with three junctions. In the spring of 96, there was water all over. Something had exploded within the wall. There was a flood in the apartment below. And that's when I said, enough, either you do the work correctly or I'm out. So they came with their welders in the middle of all my personal belongings, books and furniture, and this is the result. <laughs> Lena left her room in this state for seven years in order to force the heads of Moscow Town Hall to have the work done properly. In the meantime, she has gone to live with her friend. I said to myself, I'm not going to live like that anymore. I will never come back here. It's not a matter of principle, but you just can't walk all over people like that. No one has the right to reduce others to nothing. Leaving her room in a mess is the way for Lena to put pressure on the city of Moscow to obtain an individual apartment, the home of her own, at the age of 50, for the first time in her life. Isn't there an easier way to obtain an apartment? I don't know, for example, give $6,000 under the table to some civil worker? I don't know who has done that. First of all, I don't have $6,000. And then, what would I get for my $6,000? Nothing. And anyway, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that sort of thing, and I don't want to bribe those bastards. Do you think that all your misfortunes are due to the old or the new system? You know, I think that between the old and the new system, nothing has really changed. The system is still the same. Nineteen ninety. Flashback to try to understand the disappointment of all generations within the Kazakov family. Seven years ago, Nicholas Kazakov was already in the streets demonstrating for the anniversary of the revolution. At the time, communists still had the right to demonstrate on Red Square. My grandfather lived like a political leader. He was self-assured about his life. 
He listened to Lenin at the Council of Moscow, sang revolutionary songs. The revolution, the Dejinsky Committee, the factory, the unjustly condemned through the ages. The Communist Party at Zill includes 28,000 militants at the time. The director of the Communist Party is Vladimir Nosov, here on the left. In 1998, we met with Nosov again. He is no longer director of the Communist Party, but after taking a short leave of absence, he is back in management. Today, he is the factory's deputy technical manager. Are you still a communist? In my heart, yes, I am. I am a communist. I mean, are you a member of the Communist Party? I do not officially belong to any party, neither to that of Zyaganov nor to another. But I have never betrayed the ideas of my party and I still have my membership card. But uh, did you take part in the demonstration on the 7th of November in Moscow? No. At that time, I was walking on the Champs-Élysées. I was in France. <laughs> Times change very quickly in Russia. Eight years ago, in 1990, Nosov could not have been strolling down the Champs-Élysées on the very day of the revolution. Like Nicholas Kazakov, he was obliged to be on Red Square that day. Indeed, at that time, they had to close ranks. After the perestroika, which turned the country upside down, and for Gorbachev and his surroundings, it is time to set the record straight. Kazakov did not know it at the time, of course, but it was the last time he would greet the secretary general. It was the very last time he was going to march on Red Square. Abroad, Gorbachev's public image reached its zenith, whereas at home it was nearly chaos. It was the time of Glasnost, perestroika when Gorbachev was forced to come out on the streets to explain the changes. It was the time of the Republic's independence. It was especially the time of empty counters in shops, of endless lines to get essential food, as Tatyana, Kazakov's daughter, did here. In 1990-91, we could already feel that people's standard of living was bad. That meant that the party's policy was mistaken. The comrades were asking me questions about that. By the way, 15 days before the putsch, I met Gorbachev at the Kremlin and I passed on to him the opinion of the communists from the factory. The fact that we were very worried about the situation within the party, worried about the situation within the party, worried about the fall of the standard of living. In short, I was highly critical toward Gorbachev and his close circle's policy. By the way, I've never seen him again. So, what did he answer? He used to call me Volodya, and he said, Volodya, thank you for telling me this, but I know already. Other people from other regions have already reported to me. We're going to take real action soon, and you will feel it. You will know. Indeed, we felt it, and we saw the putsch. 1991. The Putsch. The party's old conservative guard tries to put pressure on Gorbachev to stop the democratic reforms triggered by Yeltsin, president-elect of Russia, since nearly two months. What was your attitude towards the people involved in the Putsch? You know, it was hard to tell. Those who were leading the Putsch did not seem self-assured. 
You could see it in their acts and in their eyes. Therefore, they were not to be trusted. Actually, I proved to be right. I was watching the program live on the main television channel. It was their press conference. Their hands were shaking and they were hiding their eyes. Personally, I can't follow people like that. From everywhere in Moscow, Boris Yeltsin's supporters rushed in trying to disarm the tank units which encircled the Moscow parliament, symbol of the new democratic power. In connection with that, on August 19th or 20th, I was at a friend's place. The phone rang, my friend's wife picked it up and told me, it's for you. I answered. It was Lena, my daughter. She told me in a moving way how she had spent the night in front of the Russian government headquarters. She told me that we had defended the building and that democracy had won out. At that point, I answered Lena. Now, by the way, she doesn't like me to remind her of this. I told her, my dear Lena, your idol of today will soon show his true colors. At that moment, the true colors that Yeltsin showed were those of a leader determined to block the old system. He embodies the newborn democracy in Russia. Of course there was hope when Yeltsin took office. To us he seemed much better than his opponents. At the time he was the winner, but he was unable to change anything for the better. He was powerless. Yeltsin, powerless? That is not what these pictures show soon after the putsch. The text that Yeltsin wanted to be read was the decision legalizing the government of Russia. In other words, it stipulated the end of the Soviet Union's sovereignty over Russia. In the following weeks, the Soviet Union, then the party, were dissolved. Gorbachev had to leave office. Twenty fifth of December, nineteen ninety one, at the Kremlin, eight p.m. В этот вечер Михаилу Горбачеву впервые в Кремле не налили чай. Was there a witch hunt against communists in the factory at the time? Well, I would say nothing serious happened to them. Their membership to the party did not affect them. No one was fired. Everyone stayed at their positions, working even harder. Believe me, the communists were not persecuted by Zil. No, no such thing happened. Not even stays on the sidelines? No, what we had was more of a natural and kind attitude toward them. So kind indeed that the most radical communists did not understand that they had lost. Two years later, they started again. 
But this time, by way of dialogue, Yeltsin sent the tanks. From where I was, I could hear firing in the streets. Orders were circulating. We were warned not to go out. I told my sister, listen, the counter-revolution is winning with the president at its head. When I saw that we were firing at people, that the tanks were aimed towards our men, I couldn't support that policy. They should have taken another option. That was the easiest way to settle the problem by using force. Therefore, we had a lot of victims. But then, what should they have done? We must at any rate come to an arrangement. And I think we can always find one. But that requires some will. There was no arrangement between ex-communists and new democrats. Yeltsin decided to break brutally with the past. Russia chose a punchy presidency. After those events, Russia lost the possibility of becoming a democratic country. Until October 93, we had two or three years during which it was impossible to build a normal, democratic and intellectual society. After 1993, it was over, and in the immediate future, there is nothing positive to be hoped for. The worst is that in the center of Moscow, People saw blood, they experienced the taste of blood. That is to say, they discovered another way of resolving their political problems. And that is terrifying. I'm afraid that it will happen again. Politically speaking, the future proved more civilized. Three years later, the ex-communists came back to the foreground. But this time, they respected the rules of democracy. In 1996, their candidate was called Zyuganov. He ran for presidential elections and quickly learned the lesson. At the second ballot, he got an outstanding share of the vote. Facing him, Yeltsin. He was running for the second time. He was almost an old hand. He was going to win. In Russia, people believed they had entered a new period. I voted. I voted for Yeltsin. Today, do you regret your choice? Oh, no. Of course, I have a lot of questions to ask the government today. There are a lot of things that I don't like in my life. But I try not to think about it. If the government doesn't care about us, well, I don't care about the government three times as much. What Tatyana and her family don't like in today's Russia is neither the end of the communist period nor the wealth which spreads out all over. It is what goes along with it. The Yeltsin years mean the opening of Russia towards the rest of the world the access to new cultures and new products which were formerly forbidden or even unknown. But they also mean an unrestrained economy and a mafia which rules over illegal markets. A privileged few become richer and richer while the majority of people become poorer and poorer. 
a world Anton breaks into once a year to play the new Russians. Uh, I'm not a new Russian, you see. Uh, usually I make fun of them. Why, why don't you lie to me? You know, they're so snobbish. And, uh, and look stupid and uh, their girls are usually two heads taller than they are. Господь послал на землю вал двух человечков в ноготе, нас в пику боку одевают. Карден, Тензо, ЖП, Батье. The Yeltsin years are also incarnated by that man we have just heard a symbol of free thinking in a difficult period. Andrei Voznesensky, one of the greatest Russian poets, now invited to give meaning to ordinary meetings. The Yeltsin years mark the end of a world and the beginning of a new one. Unfortunately, our country has lost the Cold War Another country has won. What we are living today is the result of our defeat. We must deal with it. Let's say that the Soviet Union didn't have the possibility to win the Cold War. We didn't have that chance. USSR was an empire, the last empire which had to implode. Unfortunately, I was born at that time. Or maybe on the contrary, I was luckily born here. Anyway, the fact that my brains work is due to the fact that I was born here. The fact that their brains work is one of the rare things for which the Soviet men can thank their country. It is because they lost the Cold War that the Communists now come out on the streets. With the defeat came a long times of great loneliness. And that period spent in the wilderness has left a deep impression within the party. Some grassroot militants have hardened their opinions and today let disturbing convictions leak out. We're all in blood, up to the eyes. Look, in 93 we decimated our country. Yes, she's right. We need a revolution because Yeltsin and Gorbachev, all those kikes and Freemasons, they've drowned the country in blood. Look, Gorbachev, he represents his foundation in the West. But what is that foundation? What it does, no one knows. Everybody welcomes him, everybody keeps the Gorbachev alive. Gorbachev, he did the brainwashing. And Yeltsin came after him. If everybody was aware of that, mobilization would be stronger. So, in order not to lose its bearings, the party has comrade Zyuganov. A Dillier speech? Perhaps not. In 1998, at the Duma, you cannot get away from communists. Any political solution must consider them. <laughs> 